Well, hey, everyone. Welcome or welcome back to Truth Unites. Truth Unites is a place for theology and apologetics done in an ironic way. And I'm here with Christopher Watkin, who is, I hope I'll pronounce this right, an associate professor at Monash University. <laughs> and he's the author of this widely celebrated book, Biblical Critical Theory, How the Bible's Unfolding Story Makes Sense of Modern Life and Culture. I'm going to say more about it in a second, and there's a link to the book in the video description. But Christopher, thanks so much for doing this. How are you doing today? Thank you so much for having me, Gavin. I am really looking forward to it. This is going to be the highlight of my day. It's lovely to be here. Yeah, yeah, likewise. And I want to say, I, I just mentioned this to you, but I'm going to say several things about your book, about how important it is. And I, I promise I don't just say this about <laughs> every book that I'm talking about. I, I, and I'm not just flattering you. I think this book is so important and so interesting. Um, it's about 650 pages. So it's a lengthy book and it's an academic book. You know, it's got footnotes and so forth. So um, most books that are this long, I, I don't it's very rare for me to say to someone to take the time to read every single sentence in a book that's that long. But this is one of those books that I really think is so important. And I just wanted to ask you kind of for the backstory, you know, as I was reading it, I was, you know, you'll have a footnote of a, a letter from Cornelius Van Til to Carl Henry, you know, little tiny things like this. And I was thinking, this must have been a lifetime of thought that stands behind this book. When did you first start working on this, thinking about it? Tell us kind of the backstory of how it came about. Yeah, uh, th there are lots of start points, I guess. The, the point I knew that I wanted to write a book that would end up something like this was probably in the first year of my undergraduate degree, um, when I was frustrated at not being able to bring the philosophers that I was studying into conversation with my Christian faith and the Bible. Um, the, the first time that I knew the shape that it would take was when I read Augustine's City of God. And I thought, oh, oh, I see. That's what it looks like. That's what deep, incisive, subversive cultural critique of a whole culture looks like. And then the moment that I got down to really starting the reading and starting mapping it out was, I think, around 2015. I listened to a series of... Um, sort of Bible overview sermons by Tim Keller. I forget what they were called. And that was the, the beginning of the, the skeleton that I then tried to go back and fill in with all these different sort of references uh, later on. Okay. Well, I know as an author, sometimes it's fun to hear how your book impacted someone. So my first question here is, I, well, I guess the first question beyond the backstory about the book itself is I would just want to articulate succinctly the impact that it had upon me and see if this was the kind of thing you were hoping for or if I just completely <laughs> missed it. But the way I'd summarize it is to say the biblical story is far better than every other story. That is the most succinct way I can distill down the kind of the sense of the emotional impact, but also just the, uh, the intellectual impact. Is that what you were hoping it would do for readers? Yes, I, I'm always hesitant to say this is the thing I hope it would achieve because, you know, God in his grace works in different people in different ways. <laughs> I'm not going to tell him what my book should do uh, for people, but that's certainly one of the things that it did for me. It, I, I love the way that you included the word story in what you said, because I think the idea that as Christians, we live in a reality that is fundamentally storied, that can't be understood without a story, is quite unusual in terms of views of the world and incredibly rich and delicious as well for the way in which it, it helps you to inhabit reality. So I think that getting the sense of the, the richness and depth and impact on a person's life of the biblical story is certainly one thing that, um, that I take away from the experience of writing it. So for readers to know uh, what to expect as they get into the book, if if uh, if I'm trying to summarize kind of what you're trying to do, it, it seems like you're trying to turn the tables on modern critical theories and basically saying we don't just need to explain the Bible to the culture. We need to explain the culture through the lens of the Bible. And you mentioned Augustine's uh, City of God is kind of a model for this kind of cultural apologetics. Um, maybe you could just say a little bit about what is cultural apologetics? Why do you think that kind of approach is helpful right now? Yeah, thank you. You, you use the language of turning the tables on modern critical theories. I, I think that the book is attempting to do something bigger than that, because the, 
that that language gives a sense that critical theories are setting the horizon for the book within which the book is operating. Mm. And what I'm wanting to try and show is that what we call modern critical theories are actually quite a small part of a much richer enterprise with a much longer history. And it's actually a history that begins growing in, in Christian soil. So if we look back in history to the first moment when a, a culture as a whole is critiqued from a position, from an ideological position outside of it, I think we'd struggle to get back further than, than the city of God. Um, and, and there's a sense, therefore, in which the, the whole enterprise of cultural critique, of which critical theory is a small part, is, is a fundamentally Christian enterprise. And the, I think there are good theological reasons for that as well. So if, if you look the whole way through the Bible, there's a narrative of critique within Hebrew and then New Testament society that's sort of embedded within that society. Yeah, the, 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 the office of the prophet in the Old Testament is sort of recognized as having authority, even if the kings don't like what the prophets say, there's a place for them in society. And that's really quite odd because what the prophets spend most of their time doing is calling out the ruling authorities of the nation um, in, and decrying their sins. And then of course, you know, Jesus with the Pharisees uh, saying, this is not how the society should be. You know, I'm calling you to something better, to God's vision. And the reason that that's possible from a Christian point of view is that we've got something to measure society against that doesn't come from society itself. Mm. Um, and I, I think there's a recognition of the need for this in secular thinkers. There's, there's one particular moment towards the end of Theodore Adorno's book, Minima Moralia. He was a, a member of the Frankfurt School of Critical Theory. And he says what we need is a standpoint of redemption. Now, he's not a Christian. He doesn't believe in redemption through Christ, but he reaches for that theological language, I think, for significant reasons, that you need a position to stand outside society that shows you what it would be like if everything were going well, what a redeemed society would be like. And without that, you can't do cultural critique because all you've got is the way things are. And if that's everything there is, then why should things be different? And so the, if you like, the enterprise of, of modern secular cultural critique fits within that bigger theological frame rather than the theological frame responding to something that, that originates outside itself. Now, I think that's a really key piece of the jigsaw puzzle for Christians to get. So when Christians do what today we call cultural critique or even critical theory, uh, first of all, there's a richly biblical way of doing it. It's different to the way that it's done in society, but also it's a very thoroughly Christian thing to do. We, we're not sort of I don't know, walking into enemy territory when we do cultural critique. This is the sort of thing that the prophets and Jesus and Augustine do and have introduced into our tradition. So in a sense, this is our gift, you know, to, to, to use slightly awkward language, to the society, uh, to be able to critique it and say, no, things could be better. It's not that the way things are is the way they have to be. There's always been a king, so there always will be a king. Things can change mm -hmm. and things will change. Um, and that's a fundamentally Christian thing to hold on to. Yeah, 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 that's wonderful. So so let's suppose someone's watching this and uh, they're a Christian and they want to evangelize their friends, they want to share the gospel, but they're kind of not sold on why it's important to have a cultural theory. Maybe you could just really break down a, a practical answer of just why should Christians engage in cultural critique? Yeah, I think it's a really good question and it's an important one. Um, I think for, for Christians to have a handle on because the, the people who ask that sort of question sometimes think that there's a choice between two options and it's either to have a cultural theory or to not have a cultural theory. And I think that the reality is a bit different to that, that the choice is to have a cultural, a cultural theory that you're aware of and that you're able to critique and think about or to have a cultural theory that passes under your radar and you're not thinking about and therefore you're not able to critique at all and decide whether it's a good one or not. And so everybody has a series of filters that, that we go through life with. We just can't get up in the morning and, you know, get to work or get to school or wherever we're going without one. There are just too many choices to make and you've got to make them on the basis of some sense of what's good in life and, and some sense of the sort of things that you ought to be doing in society. You've got to decide 
what to spend your money on. You've got to decide what to spend your time on. You can't do that without some sort of framework of the good. Um, and, th and that in a, at a fundamental level is what a cultural theory is. So, so I would encourage Christians who, who have that question to say, make sure that your approach to life, that the filters that you use are um, conscious and, and you think about them and you think, is, is this a good way in the light of, of the Bible to be living? Um, or do I need to change some of the things that I'm seeing as good in the world? Because the only other option to that is to let society or the people around you decide for you. And in the same way that you wouldn't want to just give someone the keys to your house and say, take whatever you like, I'm not going to be around. You don't want to give someone the keys to your mind and say, you know, put whatever thoughts and desires you want in there, um, you know, go go ahead. And I don't mind that that, that would be irresponsible. Mm -hmm. do, do you have a quick definition of cultural apologetics and how that might differ from generic apologetics? Um, I'm not sure that I have a definition of cultural apologetics per se, but I, I've got a, a definition, if you like, of what I'm trying to do. And I think it fits sort of within cultural apologetics. I, I think there's a sense in which commending the gospel to the culture requires two things. And, you know, this is John Stott's idea of, of double listening. You've got to listen mm. to, to the Bible, listen to the word with humble reverence, he says, eager to, to obey what God says. But you've also got to listen to the world, not in the same way, not because you're eager to obey, because you want to understand it and you want to see how the gospel relates to it. Uh, you know, this is Paul's becoming all things to all people. It's quoting Roman poets in um, Greek poets in, in Acts 17. Uh, it's looking around in 1 Corinthians 1 and seeing wisdom uh, that the Greeks want and, and the power and the miraculous signs that the Hebrews want. It's, it's listening carefully to the culture in order to frame it within a biblical frame. So this is what, sorry, this is turning out into a long answer and you asked for a short one. This, this will be my final sentence. What Augustine does brilliantly in The City of God is that he fits Rome's own story of itself within the bigger story of the Bible. And he shows how Rome's story is quite a threadbare um, and inadequate one compared to the story that the Bible tells about Rome. And I think that's what I'm trying to do, show that the Bible tells a better story about the culture than the culture is able to tell about itself. Yeah. And to the extent that that's cultural apologetics, that, that's what the book is trying to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's a good sentence for us. Uh, I'm just uh, turning that in my mind a bit. Uh, the Bible tells a better story about the culture than the culture is able to tell about itself. Uh, wonderful. Now, now, would you see your book within the realm of cultural apologetics per se, or would you see it as kind of maybe relevant to that, but not necessarily an example of that? Um, it's a really good question, Gavin, but I, I don't know that I've got a really good answer. I, these these labels are sort of helpful as heuristics, aren't they? But often they they end up pigeonholing a work as well. Is is Augustine in the City of God doing cultural apologetics? Well, it, in part, yes, I think. But he's also doing more than that. I I think he's he's setting out a compelling vision for Christians mm. of the way in which the Bible shapes a posture within society, a way of being within society. So, so Rome has been sacked. What are we going to do about it? What's our attitude to that as Christians? And so that there's a strong sort of stream of edification as well as reaching out to those who don't yet know Christ in the book. And so I, I guess I'd want to say there's a cultural apologetic aspect to the book, mm -hmm. but I, I think to the extent that I've been successful in following Augustine's model, and I don't claim any sort of great level of success. I'm holding a tiny little candle to his huge blazing sun of a book. Um, but I, I think the, the aim at least is to do more than that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I, I certainly say just again to impress upon our viewers the importance of it. I think anyone who's interested in just thinking about how does Christianity make sense in the current state of the world and how can we commend the Christian gospel to others? We'll find it an invaluable resource and just so illuminating in so many ways. And even, you know, help us think about the culture, but it's also 
so filled with insights about the scripture. And so, uh, you know, we'll get into that a little bit now. Maybe uh, to, to get us further, let's talk about the idea of diagonalization. I hope I got the right number of syllables in that word. <laughs> um, what is, this is a key term throughout the book. What does that word mean? It tries to capture a way in which the Bible cuts across a lot of the oppositions that structure our modern culture. So all cultures have some oppositions in them, and indeed the Bible does as well. I'm not suggesting that every single opposition everywhere is always pernicious. Of course not. Um, but that modernity has a particular pathology of trying to understand the world in terms of dichotomies. Um, so uh, matter and form, um, uh, you know, body and spirit, um, subject and object, you know, there's, there's a whole list of them. And what Christians often stumble into is to feeling we've got to choose one of those. You know, uh, modernity gives us these two options. Oh, which one is the Bible? Oh, it's, it's over here. Oh, it's, it's over there. Um, and that, that always shoehorns the Bible into a position that's much smaller than the biblical position. And so what diagonalizing does is it takes the two options and it tries to show how they're both reductive heresies, really, of, of a bigger biblical truth. So if we take something like the, the image of beautiful image of God motif in Genesis 1, uh, there are two facets, if you like, of that motif. There's a huge dignity given to human beings because we have everything in the whole created order are in the image of God. That, that's a massive dignity. But there's also a humbling because we're not God. We're the image of God. We're, we're contingent. We're derivative on one who is greater than us. We're not the God. We're the image. And in the image of God motif, there's no sense that those things clash with each other. It's not that we're like sometimes dignified and sometimes humbled or that we're half dignified and half humbled. But then modern anthropologists take these two aspects, this dignity and this humbling, and they blow them both up out of all proportion and sort of set them in opposition to each other. So on the one hand, you've got significant strands in modern and contemporary anthropologies that will say we're really nothing other than sophisticated machines or sophisticated animals. There's no qualitative difference. There's nothing that sets human beings apart in any significant way from either machines or animals. And that captures something of the humbling of human beings. You know, we, we in Genesis 1 are made on the same day as the animals. There, there, there is something that's that's right about that. And then another stream of modern anthropology will say um, that we should essentially treat ourselves like gods in the sense that the things that gods traditionally did, we ought to do. We ought to define reality for ourselves. We ought to define ourselves for ourselves uh, and, and our own identity. Uh, we ought to define good and evil for ourselves. You decide uh, what uh, is, is good in your world. Um, and those things traditionally were, were part of um, what a, the voluntarist God in particular did. So there's a stream of theology and voluntarism. And the voluntarist God can really do whatever he, she or it wants. His will is unstoppable to the extent that, you know, if the voluntarist God wants two plus two to equal 34, can, because nothing can stand in the way of, of, of its will. Um, and that's the sort of God that, now we're encouraged to emulate. Um, you know, nothing is impossible for you. You can be anything you want to be. It's a really voluntarist way of looking at the world. And the problem is that then you've got these two anthropologies butting up against each other. And so modern society is saying to us, you're, you're really just an animal. You know, it's an uncomfortable truth, but you've got to face up to the fact that you're just a machine. You're just an animal. Oh, and by the way, you're also a voluntarist God who makes reality in your own image and decides what's good and evil and, and decides on who you are. So now, you know, go and live your life in peace and tranquility with, with those two uh, incompatible aspects. And to diagonalize that is not to say, you know, oh, well, then we must be half machines and half gods. Like, let's split the difference and compromise in the middle. That's not diagonalizing. To diagonalize it is to say both of those are dismembered limbs mm. of a beautiful biblical whole, that the image of God, there's something that the idea that we're machines or animals is trying to grasp at, which is, you know, we're on the creature side of the creator-creature distinction. We, we're not gods, we're not God, 
Um, but it, it's got it wrong and twisted and, and blown out of all proportion. And there's something right that the the idea that we're voluntary gods is trying to grasp at, which is that we're not just like machines or just like the other animals. There is some capacity that we have that, that goes beyond that. You know, Adam naming the animals. There's some authority that we have that goes beyond that. And But that's also blown out of all proportion and taken out of the biblical context. And so to diagonalize it is to say, well, neither of those things, and yet something of both of them, but untwist it and repatriate it to the image of God. And in that sense, it's it's not in the language that people sometimes use. It's not a third way, as if the di the modern dichotomy comes along first, and then the Christian comes up and says, "Oh, what are we going to do with this dichotomy? Let's let's meet in the middle." It's it's more like a first way, like the image of God comes first, God's good creation comes first, and then human beings misunderstanding and mess around with it and distort it. And so what you're trying to do in diagonalization is is reach back to the first way before the modern dichotomies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As I'm hearing you talk about that, it's reinforcing what we've said a little bit already in my own heart and mind of that the Christian story is this far more expansive and beautiful story. And what the culture is kind of grasping at, lunging at times this direction, at times this direction, the biblical story is uh, is positioned to deliver to us. And so it's it's really a hopeful uh, uh, reminder as we think about it. Let, let's talk about another example of it, and that's on the doctrine of the Trinity, the first chapter that you go through. This was beautiful. You talk about how the doctrine of the Trinity means ultimate reality is both personal and absolute. Can you walk us through how that diagonalizes some of the alternatives for ultimate reality? Some views of the world will say that ultimate reality is absolute um, and that that's a really good thing because it provides stability and order in the universe. So Aristotle's prime mover might be one example of that. Um, or some religions that, that have sort of impersonal forces or world souls. Uh, as the fundamental uh, reality behind the universe. And other religious positions will say that ultimate reality is, is fundamentally personal. Um, John Frame uses the example of the Greek and Roman gods. Uh, you know, Zeus is, is, is a person. And I know that in Greek and Roman thought there are impersonal forces as well, but just to keep it simple for a moment, so there's there's this choice. You either have an ultimate reality that's um, personal or you have an ultimate reality that's absolute. Now, the problem with that is that both of those choices include in, um, incur massive sacrifices. Um, so if ultimate reality is not personal, and this is John Frame again, you've got to reconcile yourself to the fact that everything that's personal reduces itself sooner or later to the impersonal. We're just like the, the froth on the ocean. Human beings and personality are just waves that come and go, but there's nothing substantial. There's nothing meaningful or dignified about them. Uh, and if all you have is personality, then you end up with something like the Greek pantheon, where the gods are just out of control sometimes. Like, you know, they Zeus will come down and rape a woman because he fancies doing that. And that's what, you know, powerful gods who are people can do. And that's not that's not a great universe to live in. Uh, but the beauty of the biblical account is that God is is personal, you know, one God in three persons and also absolute um, in the sense that there's only uh, uh, one God uh, and um, he is that which cannot be reduced to anything more fundamental than himself. So when you dig down in our universe, the bedrock that you hit is not a force, it's not matter, it's not an equation. It is God, the personal God. You can't pull him apart into more simple bits. That That is the most fundamental reality. And the the wonder and the beauty of living in a universe that is made by an absolute personal God um, is almost incalculably different to living in a universe that isn't. And one of the things that's really precious about that for me as a scholar in an arts faculty of a, of a university is that the fact that the universe is absolute, in a sense, underwrites the scientific enterprise. And, you know, Christians will say this quite often, that science makes sense in an ordered world and God is a God of order. So, you know, it, science sort of grew up in cultures that, that 
understood something of this God and, and that it can foster this um, scientific enterprise because our universe is ordered. But it's also the case, just as much, that because God is personal, the arts and humanities make sense mm. because there's a dignity to human beings and there's a, a worth and an importance to investigating human life in the same way that there's a worth and importance to investigating you know, the, the, the life of the natural world in the sciences. And so there's this beautiful harmony um, between artistic and scientific enterprises because of the, the Christian God, who is both absolute and personal, that if you don't have that, you always have some sort of conflict or war between the arts and the sciences. You know, today in academia, the sciences are pretty much winning because we believe in an absolute universe, but not a personal one. And in a sense, that's no surprise. Of course, that would be a consequence of believing in that sort of universe. Uh, but Christianity dignifies and sets an agenda, sets a vision for both the arts and the sciences. I just think is really beautiful. Yeah, it really is, and and you unpack that so well in the chapter, and you 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 tease out so many implications that um, a lot of us probably haven't thought about at all, or it's certainly at that level. I mean, you talk about the problem of the one and the many, and how the the doctrine of the Trinity can uh, can be a solution to this, and you go in many different directions. Let, let's talk about the next chapter, which is creation, and you do more diagonalizing here. I, I want to read a quote from the book uh, from page fifty five, and then I'll let you unpack a little bit of how. The, the biblical creation account diagonalizes some of the uh, alternatives in the ancient world and then in the modern world as well. You say, in contrast to other, this is from page 55, in contrast to other ancient creation myths, Genesis 1 is remarkably calm and ordered. No one gets hurt, no one loses a corporeal appendage, and no one dies. The universe is not created in war and through fighting, but in peace and through speaking. Do you want to unpack a little bit about where, how the biblical creation account differs from alternatives? Um, I think Paul would say much in every way. <laughs> That's, um, it's the difference between living in a reality, the fundamental heartbeat of which is peace and harmony, mm -hmm. and living in a reality, the fundamental heartbeat of which, mm -hmm. when you when you pair everything back and, and get get down to to um, to the foundations is actually war and violence mm. and this this comes out for example in a lot of modern philosophy like Nietzsche will will have this view of, of a world that is fundamentally conflict you know there are little islands of peace that break out and we're not always killing each other of course um but the the heartbeat of the world is um power struggles uh, Thomas Hobbes is really um, vivid on this at the beginning of modernity in, in his um, Leviathan and elsewhere, where he says that without some sort of very powerful ruler to knock us into shape, we, we're in a situation of war of all against all. And it doesn't mean we're always at war. He means there's always a disposition of war. You're always mistrusting people. And that's your reality. If, if conflict is at its core, you know, it's sort of, um, I guess, a a crude Darwinian view of reality. It, it's essentially competition. Some of us are going to succeed. Some of us are going to fail. Not everybody can succeed. So you're in you're in fundamental and irreducible competition. And you can pretend you're not, but it doesn't make any difference. You fundamentally are. And that's a, a world of violence um, with little islands of peace and tranquility. Mm -hmm. But the, the biblical view of things uh, is that the the first the foundations of the world are foundations of peace Genesis one and two. Uh, there's no sense of Adam and Eve competing with each other or competing with the animals. There's an abundance. Everything is is lavishly provided by God's gracious hand. There's a harmony. There's not a sense in Genesis one and two of you've got to kill the animals or they're going to kill you. Uh, there's no um, there's no crumb of violence in there. And of course, we live in a world after Genesis 3 that, that is shot through with violence, but it's not fundamental for the Christian view. What's fundamental, original and final at the end of Revelation is, is peace and harmony. And that really shapes two attitudes to the world and to human life and to what it means to be a human and how we relate to other people. So if, if I think that I was made 
to be at peace with you and in harmony with you, um, and and that is my destiny, then I think I will relate to you really quite differently than if I think that fundamentally when all the veneer of society has been stripped away, and this is a sort of Lord of the Fly situation, you know, we, we can be nice to each other, but beneath that, there is there is a vicious competition. Um, and those two realities shape two ways of doing society and two ways of being with each other and two ways of interacting with each other. Yeah, yeah, fascinating. Uh, the next chapter is on humanity. <clears throat> I'd, I'd like to ask a more specific question about this point. Uh, it was really interesting to me, one of the things you were drawing out from Genesis 2 and the nature of human beings is that there is some kind of room for progress in human beings and in the way we relate to our environment. And I could imagine a Christian reading this and maybe feeling a little nervous, like, but how would that be different from, uh, you know, a, a transhumanism or something like this? And, uh, you know, I think a lot of Christians, for very understandable reasons, have a very pessimistic view of <laughs> our own nature and the world right now and everything. And so it's, in a way, again, it's a little bit more hopeful the way you're painting a more balanced picture where you're talking about sin and and limitation and finitude, but at the same time, there is a possibility for progress. And I, I did want to ask you about that. Could you unpack a little bit about what what do you mean when you speak of progress as uh, something that's possible for human beings? It's another case, I think, of diagonalization. So the two reductive positions that we're invited to choose one or the other of is either, oh, you mustn't do anything to to help humans to progress because, you know, God has made us as we are and so we shouldn't tinker with ourselves. Um, or we should do absolutely everything that is within our power to change us in whatever way we think we need changing. And the problem with the first one is where do you stop? You know, so do I take my glasses off because they're artificially um, improving my eyesight? Do I never take you know, paracetamol when I get a headache because that's an artificial. Do I do I strip myself of my human language because that has developed over time as a way to facilitate human relationships? So should I not use that? It becomes very silly. You know, should I not wear clothes? It, it, it becomes very silly very quickly. And I think there's a sense in, in Genesis in which human beings are the beings that improve themselves and that, that have a job to do. have got to work out how to do it and develop the technology to do it and, and get on and um, sort of incrementally do it better over time. Um, but then again, you can lurch to the other side and say, well, you know, then we should just do whatever we can, whenever we can, however we can. And the problem with that, and you use the example of transhumanism, is if we think we need improving in fundamental ways that are uh, many of them irreversible, then who is it that's going to decide what the improvement should look like? Well, it's us. OK, but we're the ones who need improving. So why should we trust our judgment on how we need improving? But it's not just us as a human race. It's us as particular, largely Western, Western educated, majority male people. And would we want to remake the whole human race in the image of any one subset of the human race or in terms of what any one subset of the human race thinks would count as an improvement? That is really problematic and sort of, you know, smells of, of, of imperialism and colonization and all those, all those very unpleasant uh, things. And so, so there's a sense in which saying that human beings are the beings that, that improve ourselves doesn't then throw you into the um, sort of box of saying, well, you know, let's, let's just do transhumanism then. Um, and, and I think both of these, again, are trying to get at something from the Bible. So the people who say we shouldn't do anything because God has made us recognize that we're in the image of God and, and we're contingent beings. We don't we're not the voluntarist gods who decide for ourselves on our own reality and, and identity. We, we're derivative and contingent. And, and there's something right and, and beautiful about that. Uh, but then the transhumanist people are the voluntarist God people who think, right, you know, let's define ourselves then. Um, which I think is equally inadequate and reductive uh, as a way of coming to terms with with who God has made us to be. Fascinating. Uh, in the chapter on sin and fallenness, you talk about how the, the line of good and evil goes through every human heart. Uh, 
And so it goes through all, all of us. It's not just between one tribe and another. I want to read this to make sure I get it right. And then I want to ask you about some of the implications for um, how we understand oppression and victimhood, because you raise this concern and, and then work through it. I think people could find that helpful to hear your thoughts on it. So you say, this is from page 127, there is a fault line between good and evil, but it does not run between aspects of creation, between human faculties, or between different social groups. It runs down the middle of them all. And then, it, and then you raise this question of, well, what does this mean for uh, marginalized groups? You know, the poor, for example, does that displace the concern we should have for them? And you give a really helpful treatment walking through that. Could you unpack a little bit about how you address that concern? Absolutely. Um, at the risk of sounding a bit repetitive for you and your viewers, it's another diagonalization, I'm afraid. Um, so the, the two options that we sort of given today in society, and again, they're just really inadequate, really blunt options, are we either say all sin and blame and fault is personal. And if you haven't got on in society, it's your fault. There's nothing structural holding you back. It's because you're lazy or you haven't tried or whatever. And anyone who tries hard can make it in our society. There, there's only personal responsibility and personal fault. And the other view is uh, that there's really only structural problems. And if we get the structure sorted out, everything is going to be fantastic and everyone is going to thrive and uh, be the best versions of themselves. Um, and to, to blame individuals uh, is uh, really obnoxious uh, because the only thing that's wrong are the structures. Um, and there are passage, if you just take individual passages from the Bible, you can find um, verses that agree with both of those. Um, that, you know, it's very clear in the Bible that we have a personal responsibility uh, before God, uh, that no one can die for the sins of another. Everyone dies for their own sins. And, and so there's a sense in which I, whoever I am, rich or poor, wh whatever group I belong to, have that burden of sin that, that needs dealing with before God. And belonging to a particular group doesn't make that go away. Um, but there's also a sense in the Bible that groups are... Um, particularly uh, uh, sought to be privileged and lifted up like like the poor and the widows, you know, seek those people out, try and do good to those people um, uh, in a way that you wouldn't necessarily do for everyone. So so there is a singling particular groups out and also singling groups out for, for judgment as well. You know, so are we to believe that everybody in the um, ancient civilization of Babylon was equally to blame for Babylon's sins, and, and yet Babylon as a whole is judged. Or, or Daniel, when he's praying in the book of Daniel, asks for forgiveness for sins that he personally didn't commit. He takes the, the responsibility of the sins of his nation. And so that, that there's a lot of biblical warrant as well for thinking in terms of groups. But the beauty of the Bible is that it doesn't sacrifice either of these on the altar of the other one. It doesn't say we're responsible personally, Therefore, groups are utterly irrelevant and we should be blind to them. And it doesn't say, you know, there are some groups that need to be treated with special honour and, and some groups that fall under judgment and therefore personal sin has no meaning. Um, and it manages to hold these two together again in a, in a very rich harmony. And what our contemporary society does is it pulls apart these two aspects of biblical truth opposes them to each other you know so the people who talk about personal responsibility will throw stones at the people who talk about structural uh, problems and the other way around and, and make us choose between them but the christian should say why on earth should i choose between them when they're both reductive heresies of, of a much richer and more adequate biblical truth mm. the uh, chapter on the exodus was fascinating uh and one of the things i learned from this chapter is you pointed out that the idea of liberation from conformity is not a universal sort of value throughout different cultures, but that's something that's somewhat unique to Western civilization. And uh, I'm just curious if maybe you could unpack that a little bit in terms of, especially, and I'm guessing the answer will have something to do with diagonalization again, but how, 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 does, the, uh, how does the biblical view of freedom differ from alternatives we might see? See if I can get through this answer without mentioning diagonalization, if I can. <laughs> that's fine if you do. Um, I, I'm not saying that there's no mention of freedom at all anywhere else apart from uh, in the Bible, but 
what, what I am saying off the back of two books, uh, Michael Waltz's Exodus and Revolution and John Coffey's Exodus and Liberation, is that the Exodus narrative fundamentally shapes Western attitudes to identity and liberation. Um, that the, the Exodus sets a pattern for a group finding them finding their identity in the idea that they've been freed from slavery uh, and building a nation and an identity upon that reality that, that you don't find elsewhere in, in a way that has the same influence. Um, so, so the idea that liberation is foundational to who we are, um, I'm persuaded from these two books, is an exotic paradigm. We get that from the Exodus. And it wasn't, you know, you don't find the Babylonians and Assyrians saying similar things. This is a, a very particularly Hebrew thing that is then taken up in the New Testament. You know, Paul, when he talks about salvation, has Exodus imagery going off all over the place. So this is fundamental to the way we understand salvation in Christ as well, drawing on this Exodus imagery. And the philosopher Jean-Francois Lyotard, the postmodern condition guy, um, talks about this as an emancipation narrative. And he says the modern West is hooked. There's not, this is my language, not his, hooked on this emancipation narrative that we understand ourselves and get our sense of meaning and worth from the fact that we have been and continue to be liberated from various oppressions. So, you know, we look back and the enlightenment liberated us from the oppression of superstition uh, for, the, for the liberty of reason, for example. And then in the 20th century, you can see the idea of social progress being structured around a sequence of progressive liberations mm -hmm. as well. Um, and Lyotard's point is that this has become the way that we understand who we are. If we are not those who are being liberated, we lose our sense of importance, our sense of worth. And the, I think the way that that relates to the Bible is, is that you don't want to, from a biblical point of view, sort of oppose that because the Exodus is so fundamental and freedom in Christ, the freedom that Christ brings us is so fundamental. But the, the Bible puts it in a richer and broader context. So the Exodus is not the only thing that happens in the Old Testament um, and being saved by Christ, being freed by Christ is not the only thing that happens in the New Testament. And so there's this richer ecosystem of a narrative uh, that, that has creation, fall, redemption and consummation as part of it that sets liberation within a broader frame that actually makes sense of liberation and gives it a, a, a depth and a uh, a meaningfulness that it would struggle to have just by itself. Um, and the, the tragedy of modernity is that, it, again, it has taken this fundamental biblical dynamic, but it's wrenched it out of its biblical ecosystem. So it's, it's trying to make liberation work all by itself without reference to anything outside itself. And, and it, it's very difficult to do that in a way that, that is healthy. You know, as we're talking, one of the things that comes to my mind is that it seems as though many uh, criticisms of the Bible and of Christianity from West, from the Western culture seem like they are actually implicitly borrowing from biblical values. Do you see that? Uh, is that? Well, this, I mean, if, if Tom Holland or Glenn Scrivener are on this call, they would be vigorously nodding at this point. That's the argument that, that they make. Um, and I think it's, I think it's right, but I think it needs a footnote. So, so they will say, Tom Holland will say, that the, the debates that are going on in society uh, at the moment between different factions are both taking parts of Christian truth and setting them against each other. So he's not using the term diagonalization, but he's sort of saying that that's what's going on. And Glenn Scrivener's book, The Air We Breathe, makes a similar point. I think the footnote that I'd add to that though, is you can't just take an idea out of a biblical context or out of a biblical ecosystem and have it do the same work for you that it does within a biblical context. So, for example, you can't take the idea of freedom or the exodus out of its biblical ecosystem and expect to establish that one species in a new climate and it still be the same species, it still thrive in the way that it did in a biblical ecosystem. So when we talk about freedom, 
we say, you know, freedom is a, a, a Christian value or something like that. I think we also need to recognize that as soon as you wrench it out of the biblical context, it begins to mean something different. It has to because you don't have those fundamental axes and coordinates of, of you know, the absolute personal God and, and human responsibility and stuff like that anymore. Um, so, yes, these are values that derive from the Bible, but once you take them out of the Bible, they become really in fundamental ways that might not necessarily be visible on the surface. They become very different. Mm, yeah. Um, the chapter on the wisdom literature in Scripture you talk about how the Bible gives a sort of multi-perspectival view of wisdom. So, you know, Job, Ecclesiastes, and Proverbs are all sort of balancing each other, or I don't know if balancing is the right word, but if you took one of them out, you'd get a bit of a skewed portrait. And uh, in light of that, I, I wanted to ask you how you would interpret this. I have had many uh, friends who are very sort of modern people who have come to Christ through the influence of the book of Ecclesiastes. Something about that book has impacted them to lead them toward Christ. How how do you understand that? How would you interpret that? Um, I th I think there are two questions there. That the first one is the immediate one about Ecclesiastes, um, and I think I think it resonates with a sense of frustration and meaninglessness that a lot of people experience today. It's a very Un, I've got to choose my words very carefully here. Uh, unorthodox, not in a theological way, but in a oh, I wouldn't have expected that sort of book to be in the Bible sort of way. Um, someone sort of questioning everything and and wondering what their life's all about and searching mm. for meaning in all the wrong places. Um, and I, I think there's something about the way that that engages with the meaning deficit in in contemporary society that's just really surprising and refreshing and helpful for a lot of people. Um, but then the, the broader question is, well, what about the whole ecosystem of, of the wisdom literature then? And I guess if Ecclesiastes is your gateway into a biblical way of thinking about the world, then there would be something deficient if that was where you ended up, like if Ecclesiastes was your whole Bible, um, there, there would be a very skewed and quite a, I think quite a, a bitter way uh, of looking at the world. And so, you know, a book like Proverbs, which it, in a sense pro provides a countervailing take on reality to Ecclesiastes. So if Ecclesiastes is nothing ever goes the way that you expect it to, and the, the righteous suffer and the wicked prosper, and there's no up or down to any of it all, your Proverbs is very much, no, the righteous always prosper, the wicked always suffer, and you get out what you put in. Um, and it's it's a transparent sort of reality that rewards effort. Um, I think the question arises, well, why not just say both of those things in one book? Why not just like amalgamate it and say, sometimes things work, sometimes things don't. Sometimes you think the world is wonderful. Sometimes you'll find the world just a frustrating mess. Um, and I think the reason that there are two books rather than one sort of combined book, one reason is, is just that sometimes life feels as though it's all like Ecclesiastes. Like, mm. you know, you're not thinking reasonably in those moments and trying to say, well, you know, next week I might feel different. No, life just sucks right now. The whole of it. That is my whole horizon. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes, you know, when particular seasons of success, you might be in a proverbian mood where everything seems to be going right. And, and both of these lenses on reality reflect uh, the truth of a particular experience uh, and in a way that trying to merge them both together wouldn't but having them side by side I think is just really existentially authentic to, to use mm -hmm. that that language in the bible and and I, I I love it that it is that way and if it was just proverbs and no ecclesiastes you think oh this is you know this doesn't add up this is too perfect and if it was all Ecclesiastes and no Proverbs, you'd never get out of bed in the morning. Um, so, you you know, you need both of those perspectives. And the wisdom, precisely, is in being able to hold both of those realities in their proper biblical proportions and set them in the context of the rest of the Bible and live a life that neither denies the reality of Ecclesiastes nor denies uh, the reality of Proverbs. 
Yeah. yeah. Your comments are helping me appreciate the the richness and uh, diversity of Scripture as it comes to us. It's all uh, God breathed, but it is so uh, rich and varied, and that helps uh, helps us make it through this world. Um, let me ask you a question about the. Uh, you, you talk about the logic of grace in the chapter on the cross. This is a more practical question, and it has to do with Christians not looking down on others in the way we talk, which is it's very much drawn out of the, 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 the logic of the chapter, but it's just so helpful in the current cultural moment, it seems to me, that Christians really internalize what you're saying here. So I want to read the whole paragraph and then just ask you to unpack this a little bit. You say, if I am a Christian, those who disagree with me are not, by default, intellectually inferior They are not rationally benighted. They do not lack imagination. They are not narrow, weak, or juvenile. They are not medieval. They are certainly not a virus. They have every chance of being my betters in all these respects. And you you unpack that even further from there, that that's not a rhetorical statement that that really is genuinely true. Can you unpack that a little bit? Why is that the case? And why is that so important for us to understand? Thank you. That I think there are deep theological reasons for that being the case. It's, it's not just sort of a nice thing to say. Mm-hmm. Um, and this, I'm, I'm getting this from um, Tim Keller. I think it's a chapter in The Reason for God. And he's got this, this very helpful way of talking about drawing lines is the metaphor he uses. So he says, everybody draws lines between in-groups and out-groups. So it's mm-hmm. either um, the uh, the the good rational people against the evil superstitious people, or it's the good liberals against the bad conservatives, or the other way around, the good conservatives against the bad liberals. Um, and he says, you can't avoid doing this. You know, you, you end up with something like the good people who don't draw lines against the bad people who do draw lines. You, you Everybody draws lines. Everybody has in-groups and out-groups. And if you try not to, that in itself becomes your line. But he says the problem with these is that they create um, positions where it's almost impossible not to look down your nose at people on the other side of your line. Because if I'm part of the rational group, then how can I not look down on the superstitious group? And if I'm part of the compassionate group, how can I not look down on the cruel group or or, or whatever my line is? You know, if I'm one of the wise people who doesn't draw lines, how am I not going to look down on the, you know, um, stupid people who do draw lines? But he says the nature of the Christian's line is very curious and refreshing uh, in this context and and peace bringing because he says the Christian draws lines, but our lines are drawn on the basis of grace. So the in-group has nothing over the out-group. I'm a Christian not because I'm cleverer or wiser or more compassionate or more empathetic or anything than anyone else. Like my salvation doesn't rest on any quality or achievement of my own. It rests purely on God's grace. And therefore, my line doesn't give me any basis, any rationale for looking down on people on the other side of my line. You know, they they probably are going to be more intelligent, more compassionate, more empathetic than me, because that's not why I'm a Christian. Um, And that means that Christians are predisposed to Um, not look down our noses. And indeed, at the moment, we do look down our noses at people who haven't received grace. It shows that we just haven't understood the first thing about grace. Uh, It shows that we're not being authentic Christians in that sense. If we turn grace into one more of these lines that you draw to show how you're superior to other people, then you might be many things, but not not a Christian. (laughs) You have walked away from Christianity at that point. Um, and, and this is just fundamentally um, life bringing and peace bringing and, and ironic in society. But there's also a sense, I, I'll end with this, in which it's so easy to make it into just one more line. Like yeah. you're, you're always one thought yeah. away, one sentence away yeah. from transforming grace into a reason to feel superior over other people. So it's not as if it's, uh, you know, the, the the Christian can't stumble into this and that we don't all stumble into this. But the, the, the argument is that the logic of the Christian position always undermines looking down your nose. We all do it, but the logic of our position uh, laughs at that 
and denounces that and subverts that in a way that the logic of other positions don't necessarily do in the same way. Right, right. So we'll just need to be careful along the way that we don't start thinking, well, I'm the one who really understands grace, unlike those other people over there. <laughs> because, of course, this is what you're saying, that we it can become very ironic and uh, we, can, we can be a Pharisee about even that. So it's always a reason to be so careful and self-critical. But, um, but no, what you just said is so helpful. And, and uh, yeah, it seems to me, to me just so needed right now. I mean, uh, here's just a practical question. How do you think our witness as Christians would be better? if we did that more frequently, if we didn't look down on others? Oh, that's a huge question, isn't it? Um, I have often gone away from listening to debates or taking part in conversations, being more impacted by the way in which someone spoke than what they said. Mm. Um, and I suspect that's probably the same for others as well. Uh, it's possible to win an argument in a really obnoxious way and to leave people thinking, well, you know, they, they bested the other person, but I wouldn't want to believe what they believe. That's just, you know, um, don't want to end up like them. You know, they, were, they were really nasty to the person they were speaking with. Um, and I suppose it, it goes back to the reality that there's, we're, we're complex beings, aren't we? And we, we reflect Christ not only in the ideas that we articulate, but in the way in which we engage with other people. You know, this, um, and in a sense, the, there's a primacy of at least the first thing that strikes you about someone is how they are before what they say. Um, and as Christians, if we're to love God and love our neighbor, that the first indication that people are going to get of whether we're doing that is not going to be the brilliance of our arguments. It's going to be how we treat them. Um, not that the arguments don't matter at all, but you can't sort of separate the two. It's it's all part of, you know, being a good ambassador. Mm -hmm. D does that help? Oh, man, yes. The way I'm experiencing that right now as I'm listening is that all of that is is so helpful. And I've thought about that many times in the past, but I'm just having to sort of humble myself under that afresh, because up till the moment we sat down together, I was doing preparations for a debate. <laughs> and it's uh, next week, and I'm just reminded of this afresh, of just the importance of what you're saying. And boy, it's easy to steer away from that. I, I, my own experience is that in the current state of the world, especially being on YouTube, for example, the dynamics are such that where it's very easy to start off doing fine and then get pulled into negativity and triumphalism because we have so much coming at us and it's hard to remain focused in to gracious speech it absolutely is and i mean jesus is our great example here isn't he and i think he cautions us against either just being nasty all the time or just being cute and cuddly all the time like he plays the whole keyboard doesn't he you know there's the woman caught in adultery and he just you know kneels down and and writes in the sand and takes his time and doesn't condemn her. And then he just unloads both barrels on the Pharisees, you know, you brood of vipers. And mm -hmm. if Jesus is the ultimate example of, of love, then both of those things are loving. Mm -hmm. And that the huge wisdom and the, the difficult wisdom is knowing <laughs> what is a woman caught in adultery situation and what is a Pharisee situation. Mm -hmm. and, and I guess as Christians, we want to model and reflect the whole spectrum of, of Jesus's um, emotional responses to things. Um, but it's so hard for us that we, you know, we tend to Pharisee the woman caught in adultery and we tend to woman caught in adultery the Pharisee all the time. Um, and, you know, go hard when we should be soft and soft when we should be hard. And, and it's it's really difficult to know which form of, of love is needed in different contexts. So I'm not saying always always be meek um, right. in, in in that sort of monotone sort of way i'm trying to say be like jesus mm. and that's really hard yeah 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 oh yeah the we could almost say the character of christ is going to diagonalize us in different forms of uh, uh, uh different values we might gravitate toward at different times one or the other but we, th that's helpful what you said that yeah we are our, our fleshly tendency might be to be strong when we should be more meek or meek when we should be more strong. And so we'll need the Holy Spirit's help. 
you just left can the I say one more thing about that as I reflect on it that different people have different personalities and that's okay mm-hmm. and we work together as the body of Christ and so there'll be some Christians who are really good at doing the Pharisee thing in a in a godly way and don't take it too far but can really call out in a direct and and confrontational way and there'll be other Christians who are much better at the, the sort of ironic thing and so none of us will be able equally to do all of it in the way that Jesus was but it's working together as a body of Christ that we can cover that that whole emotional spectrum mm-hmm. not that it lets us off the hook of all trying but you know different people are, are just have different personalities Right. Yeah, that's, that's an encouragement. OK, well, so I can't say I'll do the ironic thing and you do the Pharisee thing. I guess I've got to keep yeah. working. <laughs> but we can yeah. say that working together, we will be better at, at mirroring Christ than either of us could be alone. That's a great point. That's really an encouraging thought. Well, this has been uh, fascinating. I, I have a few more questions. But let me just ask you one more, one more question. Um, uh, toward the very end of the book, in the conclusion, you talk about the need for praise, for praising God to be incorporated into our cultural theory so that we don't become cynical, we don't become overly intellectual. And that was a wonderful little note to finish the book on. Do you want to say anything to unpack your thoughts there? I think it comes back again to, to this idea that there's more to reality and more to living in God's world than just arguments or ideas. Uh, and a lot of the book deals with ideas, but I, I wanted to um, acknowledge towards the end of it that, that that's not what God requires of us. And if if you if you had saved my family from drowning, say we were at the beach and I'd gone off to buy some ice creams and my two kids had been, you know, at the point of drowning and you'd save them. And I got back and I said, oh, thank you very much. That's uh, very kind of you uh, to save uh, my children now here are the ice creams. You would look at me, you think there's something deficient about that answer. Like I have just saved the life of your two children and all you've got is a muttered thank you. Like there's, I, I need more really. <laughs> there's the humanly, there ought to be more coming out of your mouth than that at this point. And it's the same sort of thing. You know, if we, if we contemplate all that God has done for us and the richness of his grace and so forth, and we say, okay, that's really interesting. It's like, excuse me, like, have you understood what's just happened? Like this, this is an existential reality. This is not just a series of propositions that you can tick off and learn. Yeah. And, and so to respond humanly to what God has done requires more than intellectual engagement. And, and to only to engage intellectually is actually to, to show that we haven't really understood. Um, that, that's an inadequate, impoverished shriveled um reductive understanding because you can't you can't see that god has created the world in which he has that we have sinned in the way we have and that he has redeemed us in the way we have and go hmm, okay it, it just it's humanly impossible uh, and that just betrays a, a lack of understanding yeah. Well, again, let me just recommend people to to check out this book. W- would you say it's for individual readers more or for groups to take it through? Because it's got the great discussion questions at the end of each chapter. I mean, honestly, someone could get this book just to read one section of it. If they're in, if they're studying the Exodus, they might you know be. But but who's your who? What are the readers you're thinking of? I I have seen some preachers saying that it's, it's useful in preparing sermons on particular passages of the Bible. So I've, I'll take their word for that. I wrote it primarily for myself as an undergraduate in a secular university who's a Christian trying to make sense of mm. all the ideas that are flying around from a biblical point of view. Um, I think it's useful for Christians who care about culture uh, and to, to try and avoid either falling into this knee-jerk position of simply denouncing everything in the culture and setting the Bible in opposition to everything, or in simply affirming everything in the culture and showing how the Bible is a slightly better version of, of what the culture already wants. I think it, it it helps Christians to avoid both of those. Um, and I, I, I guess in, in terms of groups and individuals, my, my hope is that it will be accessible to individuals and also um, written in a way that groups can get a handle on pretty quickly. So there are these discussion questions. 
the chapters aren't massive. Um, some of them are a little bit long, but they're not, they're not huge. So you can chunk it up quite nicely for group discussion. So I, I would hope that there's enough in there for individuals um, to, to feel enriched by it, but also groups to be able to get their teeth into it. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I'm glad that you wrote it. I think people find it extremely helpful. Thanks for taking the time for this interview as well. Uh, if someone's watching this and they want to learn a little more about you, do you have a, a website or any ways that they could connect to you? I do have a bunch of Christian resources up on a website, thinking through the Bible, all one word, dot com. Um, some talks and, and other resources are up there. Um, my Twitter handle is at uh, DR for Dr. Chris Watkin. So people can follow me there. Terrific. Wonderful. Well, thanks again, Christopher. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Don't forget to check out the book in the video description. We'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.